Amen. There is much to do. There is work on every hand. Hark the cry for help comes ringing through the land. Jesus calls for reapers. I must active be. What wilt thou, O master? Here am I. Send me. That's the title of our lesson this morning. Here am I. Send me. Let's open up our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6 in verse 1. Isaiah chapter 6 in verse 1. Yes, Shanique did get me sick. She is at fault. She came over my house and she spread her germs and bacteria and viruses everywhere. And I was the recipient of those virus. And now my ears are plugged. And so if you want to encourage me today and say amen, it's got to be pretty loud. Amen. Yeah. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook. And the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, here am I. Send me. Amen. You know, right here we find Isaiah being called by the Lord in the first year that King Uzziah had previously died and that Jotham had become king in 740 B.C. And yet at this time, we understand that Israel was not at a good spot. In fact, if you look at Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 10, the Bible compares the leaders of Israel to the leaders or the rulers of Sodom. He also compares the people to the people of Gomorrah. See, that's what happens when you get the leaders of Sodom, you end up with the people of Gomorrah. And things did not work out very good for Sodom and Gomorrah. And yet despite all this, God's heart for his people is demonstrated in verse 18 of chapter 1 where he says, Come now, let us settle the matter together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. And so here we find that God is preparing to make an appeal to the people and to their leaders. And so he looks around and he goes, Whom shall I send? Whom will go for us? And in verse 8 right here of chapter 6, Isaiah says what I hope and I pray that many of us will say, here am I, send me. In chapter 8, verse 3, we find that Isaiah was a married guy. He was married to whom the Bible refers to as the prophetess. That's what happens when you marry a prophet, you become a prophetess. You may not have intended that, but if you marry a prophet, that's just what's going to happen. We also know that Isaiah had two kids. Shir Jashub in Isaiah 7.3 and Mahar Shalal Hashbaz in Isaiah 8.3. And yet when it came time to answer the call of God, Isaiah did not hide behind his family. He took a stand for God and he became perhaps the most prolific prophet of the Old Testament. In his book, we find six messianic prophecies. In chapter 7, verse 14, he predicts and prophesies that Jesus would be born of a, a virgin. In chapter 9, verse 1 through 7, he prophesies that Jesus will hail from Galilee. And we know that Jesus was Galilean. In chapter 11, verse 1 through 12, he says that he'll be from the lineage of David. In chapter 53, verse 1 through 12, he prophesies that Jesus would die for the sins of humanity. 
And chapter 61, verse 1 through 2, Isaiah prophesies that Jesus would proclaim good news to the poor. He would restore sight to the blind and free the captives and bind up the brokenhearted. Of course, Jesus claims this prophecy for himself in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 through 21. But perhaps the most convincing prophecy throughout the book of Isaiah is found in Isaiah 44, verse 28, if you can turn with me there. We know that Isaiah prophesied around 740 to maybe the early 700s or late 600s, or I should say early 600s. And in 606 BC, much later after the time of Isaiah, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians come in and take them into exile. Well, eventually the king that would allow God's people to go back to Jerusalem was King Cyrus of Persia. And yet in Isaiah's time, far before this time, he says in chapter 44, verse 28, I got to get there myself. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. He will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt. And of the temple, let its foundations be laid. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of, to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that gates will not shut. You see here, far before King Cyrus of Persia takes over Babylon and releases the exiles, Isaiah prophesies that this would happen by name. And with this, there are huge implications. That means that Isaiah knew that God's people would be taken into captivity. That means that Isaiah knew that the Babylonians would eventually be taken over by the Medo-Persians. And that means that Isaiah knew that eventually Cyrus of Persia would be the one to let the people go. And in 536 BC, according to Ezra chapter 1 verse 1, that's exactly what happens. This is the only prophecy, prophecy in the whole Bible where the Bible mentions someone in the future by name. And so there can't be any doubt. If the Bible says it, we believe it because the word of God is true. Amen. We understand and know that at around 900 BC, the kingdom of Israel divides through Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And so you have the, the, the upper 10 tribes of Israel, which become northern Israel. And you have the southern two tribes, which just become known as Judah. Well, Isaiah is called by God in the year Uzziah dies, who was king of Judah in 740 B.C. At that time, Jotham becomes king of Judah at just 25 years old. Some of us are, are still younger than 25 years old. The Bible records in 2 Chronicles 27 verse 6 that Jotham grew powerful because he walked steadfastly with God. You see, if you want to become powerful for the Lord, there's only real one way to do it. You've got to walk steadfastly with the Lord. And no doubt, Isaiah was a big part of Jotham walking closely with God. And therefore, a big part of Jotham becoming powerful for the Lord. You see, sometimes you may not be able to reach out and win somebody for Christ, but you can influence them in a powerful way for Christ. Amen? Well, Jotham dies. And Ahaz becomes king of Judah. And unlike Jotham, Ahaz was not a good king. In fact, the Bible says that he followed the ways of all the kings of Israel and also made idols for worshiping the Baals. He burned sacrifices in the valley of Ben-Hanom and sacrificed his children in the fire. And so here we find that Ahaz is king, king of Judah, and the northern tribes of Israel decide to fight against Ahaz and his kingdom. And in doing so, they ally, ally themselves with the Arameans. And so now both the Arameans and northern Israel are attacking southern Israel. And Ahaz is now being tempted by making an alliance with the Assyrians instead of relying upon God. And so God is trying to get Ahaz to return to him, to rely on him. And so he sends Isaiah to speak to Ahaz. And we'll pick it up in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 1. You with me here this morning? Yeah. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 1. It says, when Ahaz, son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, was king of Judah, 
King Rezin of Aram and Pekah son of Ramaliah, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem, but they could not overpower it. Now the house of David was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim. So the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, go out, you and your son, Shir Jashub, to meet Ahab at the end of the aqueduct at the upper pool in the roads of Lunder's field. Say to him, be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid. Do not lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood. You know, sometimes you got to appreciate the creativity that God has in calling people names. He says, don't lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood. Because of the fierce anger of Rezum and Aram and of the son of Ramaliah, Aram, Ephraim, and Ramaliah's sons have plotted your ruin, saying, let us invade Judah, let us tear it apart and divide it among ourselves and make the son of Tabio king over it. Yet this is what the sovereign Lord says. It will not take place. It will not happen. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is only resin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is only Ramaliah's son. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Wow. Our first point this morning is keep calm and carry on. Yeah. Keep calm and carry on. Haven't you seen those big banners that are placed everywhere or on Facebook? And, and usually they have a big crown at the top of them. And then underneath it's just these words, keep calm and carry on. And yet that's exactly what God says to King Ahaz right here through Isaiah. In verse 4 he says, be careful to keep calm and don't be afraid. Keep calm. Why are you tripping? Why are you freaking out? I got you. These two guys are two stubs of firewood. I will take care of you. You only have to rely and depend on me. You know, a lot of times I think we get afraid when we see situations and we become tempted to rely on things other than God. You know, I read, a, I read a story about these two guys that were on safari and uh, they were going to Africa for the first time, went to safari. And, and while they were on safari and exploring, they ran into a hungry lion. And so they're both just freaked out. I mean, there's this lion in front of them. And so one of them looks at the other one and goes, hey, remember the survival guide we read? The survival guide says, don't move and the lion will eventually go away. The guy looks back at his friend and goes, well, I know you read the book, and I read the book, but I'm not quite sure that the lion has read the book. <laughs> you know, not only when you read the book, but when you believe the book, you have no reason to be afraid. Because God will take care of you. And yet we find right here in chapter 7, verse 10, Ahab's response to God's plea for him to come back and rely on him. It says again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Sounds so spiritual. Well, I don't want to burden the Lord. And you know, it's written, don't put the Lord to the test. So I'm not going to ask for God's help. That would be testing the Lord. He goes, no, I told you to ask for my help. You know, despite Isaiah's warning, Ahaz just decides not to listen. And so historically what he does is he invites the Assyrians to come into Judah to help them against the Arameans and the northern tribes of Israel. He even takes some of the things that were in the temple and gives them to the Assyrians to win their favor. And yet... Instead of getting help from the Assyrians, this action ends up enticing the Assyrians to not help them, but to take over Judah. And so in 722 BC, the Assyrians invade Israel and Judah. You know, so often I think as disciples, again, we can turn to things other than God for our security. We, we turn to people or relationships. 
We don't feel believed in by God because we don't feel believed in by people. We don't feel loved by God because we don't feel loved by people. Or we can even get into a democratic type of thinking where we determine what's right or wrong based on what the popular majority believes instead of relying upon the truth of the scriptures for direction. We can turn to money or possessions. If I just had a million dollars, I'd be okay. I wouldn't have to worry. I don't want to be rich. I just don't want to have to worry about things. Have you ever said that before? And yet that's exactly why God won't give you a million dollars. Because God is smarter than us. He goes, if I give them what they want, they're never going to come back to me again. And sometimes God won't give you your wants because he wants you to need him. Sometimes we can throw ourselves into other causes. We can devote ourselves to things like the Red Cross, Doctors Without Borders, Habitat for Humanity, UNICEF, Sick Kids, Greenpeace, you, you name whatever cause that's out there. And we live in a generation where everybody wants to be a part of a cause. And these causes are not bad in and of themselves, but oftentimes we get so focused and devoted to causes other than the cause of Christ. We've got to have a d- deep conviction. No creed but the Bible and no cause but Christ. You know, I believe that true biblical Christianity is the only true solution for every world problem. Red Cross is not going to do it. Habitat for Humanity, yeah, they're going to build some houses. They're going to help take care of some people. The the, the different organizations to take care of homelessness. That's great. That's going to be good. But that's not going to fix the core of the problem. The core of the problem is not a physical problem, but a spiritual problem. And you can't deal with a a spiritual problem in a physical way. It's only through spreading and preaching the word of God that you can change the world. We can turn to our positions, our roles, or even our careers. We we can think that these things are are what gives our life meaning and purpose and significance. And yet, the thing that gives us meaning and significance, according to the Bible, is obeying the word of God. And yet we think things that most companies want us to think, like, They really need me here. I I can't do without me. Look at what I can do. Look at what I can produce for this company. I I really need to just throw myself in this company because this company gives me meaning and purpose for my life. But God's word is what is meant to give us meaning and purpose in our life. And it's very interesting right here because as the Assyrians came in to Israel, they took all the people into captivity. And then what the Assyrians would do is they would send them back, but they would mix them together with their own people. And so they re, uh, replant, in a way, Samaria. But, but now it's kind of like Canada where it becomes a mosaic society. You don't just have one national identity. Now you just have a scattering of all different kinds of people. And with that is not only a loss of national identity, but also a loss of theology. Because the people are mixed, and so therefore the beliefs are mixed. And so now Israel is not what it used to be. And I think that's how it is with us. Things that we oftentimes invite into our life, thinking that they're going to bring us security, are the very things that end up taking over and consuming us. You know, I appreciate what Tim was sharing about his girlfriend. And no doubt, she must have been pretty beautiful. Of course, she was 20% more beautiful than all the rest of us would think to Tim. And isn't it funny, he said that, that she's somebody I went to for comfort and security. And when you go to people for comfort and security, isn't that what we become consumed by? You know, I appreciate uh, our dear sister, Elizabeth Wademan. You know, nine years ago, she left Toronto to move to LA so that she could learn the ministry and prepare to be sent back on a mission team to Toronto. In doing so, she gave up her career as a chemist. And so she moves to LA, ends up being there for a couple of years, comes back, and she's not able to get a job right away in her field. Well, some time goes by, and she ends up just losing faith that she can work as a chemist. Ends up working at Timmy's and and various places. And eventually, she goes, man, I, I gotta get back in my field. And so she was challenged to have faith, and so she went after having faith. And this past week, after nine years of being out of her field, She was offered a job as a chemist for a company, and now she has a job as a chemist. You with me? 
And I appreciate that because it shows that, that she chose God and not her job for security. And isn't it amazing how God has now shaped her character over the last nine years? He's refined her and challenged her and changed her. And now she's not just Elizabeth working as a chemist, but now she's a better version of Elizabeth who's got a lot more faith, who's learned to rely on God, now working as a chemist and being blessed by the Lord. So I gotta ask, what are, you, what are you relying on? What are you banking on? Has your security been in things of this world or in God? So you gotta keep calm and carry on. Let's go to Isaiah 20, verse one. <clears throat> you know, here things get a little interesting. In Isaiah chapter 20 and verse 1. <clears throat> you guys with me here? Yeah. I, I can't hear you, so if you're going to say something, or, or be loud. It says in chapter 20, verse 1. In the year that the supreme commander sent by Sargon, king of Assyria, came to Ashdod and attacked and captured it, at that time the Lord spoke through Isaiah, son of Amos. He said to him, take off the sackcloth from your body and the sandals from your feet. And he did so going around stripped and barefoot. And the Lord said, just as my servant Isaiah has gone stripped and barefoot for three years, this is a sign uh, important against Is, uh, Egypt and Cush. So the king of Assyria will lead away, stripped and barefoot, the Egyptian captives and Cushite exiles, young and old, with buttocks bared to Egypt's shame. You know, here we find a, a very challenging scripture. We find a prophecy, prophecy against Egypt and Cush. And yet oftentimes, God would have his prophet illustrate his judgment against the people that he was prophesying to. And so he, he looks at Isaiah and he goes, okay, Isaiah, you're wearing some sackcloth here. And sackcloth was just basically black goatskin. And it was intentionally supposed to be itchy but because they understood that there are times where you got to make yourself uncomfortable to please God. But he goes, take that off. And Isaiah's like, all right, finally, I get to take off my, my goatskin. And then God goes, no, 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 take it all off. Whoa. Not only your clothes, but take off your sandals as well. And in verse 3, the Bible says, For three years, Isaiah was walking around without clothes and without shoes, just so that he could give a message to Egypt and to Cush. Oh, that's pretty intense. You know, it occurred to me as I read this, that Isaiah had no no-go areas with God. He had no no-go areas with God. You see, in Isaiah 7, verse 3, we find that he named his first son Shir Jashub because God told him to, which meant a remnant will return. And then in chapter 8, verse 3, he named his second son Mahar Shalal Hashbaz, which is a lot to say, but he named his son that because that's what God told him to do. And that meant quick to the plunder. Those, those, those sons' names, those kids' names, were prophetic. They're prophecies against the nation that God was telling Isaiah to prophecy against. And so once again, you see, even in how he named his kids, he submitted to the will and the plan of God. And God goes a little bit further. He not only dictates how he's going to name his kids, but now he's going to dictate what he wears. There was nothing that Isaiah was not willing to do to carry the message of God. And likewise, there needs to be nothing that we're unwilling to do to carry our cross and then carry the message of salvation to a lost world. Our second point is yeah, you gotta keep calm and carry on, but point two, you gotta keep the cross and bury qualms. <laughs> keep the cross and bury qualms. You know, so often, we can get little qualms, hesitations or reservations about things that God is asking us to do. Look, I don't, I don't know how I feel about this challenge right here. You know, cold contact evangelism, I don't, I don't know how I feel about this right here. Special missions contribution, I don't know. It's not feeling right with me right here. Well, the definition of a qualm is an uneasy or nauseous feeling. You ever feel that when, when you see something in the Bible that's calling you to do? You just get that uneasy feeling in your stomach like, oh my gosh, I don't know how I feel about this. 
Oh, I don't know. I feel so uncomfortable when I go share my faith with people. It just feels so uncomfortable and nauseous and uneasy in my stomach. I don't know how I feel about sacrificing or being committed to the meetings of the body. I just feel so uncomfortable and uneasy in my stomach. I don't know how I feel about going on dates with the sisters or the brothers. It just gives me that uneasy, uncomfortable feeling in my stomach. And I think in a way, this exposes our human sinful nature. That oftentimes we make decisions based on what we think feels good to us. We think it, if it feels good, it must be good. And yet, when Jesus calls people, he oftentimes calls them to do things that don't feel good. In fact, the very first thing he called his disciples to is he goes, hey, deny yourself and take up your cross every day. He goes, it's not about how you feel. You're, in fact, not going to feel good about the things that I'm calling you to do. You know, I don't think Jesus felt good about going to the cross. It didn't feel good for him to, to just be sweating drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. It didn't feel good for Jesus to be beaten and whipped and punched and mocked. It didn't feel good for Jesus to be whipped and then carrying his cross 650 yards to Golgotha, where he was crucified and, and essentially suffocated to death on the cross. It didn't feel good for Jesus. You know, I, I think that the biggest areas for many Christians to have qualms are in the areas of evangelism, commitments to the meetings of the body, and in sacrificial giving. You know, so often when it comes to evangelism, we want to have compartmentalized lives. You with me right here? We want to have our school friends over here, and then we'll have our, our church friends over here, and then we'll have our, our families over here, and we'll just kind of keep them all separate from each other. You know, for me, I, I grew up, and I've got uh, two brothers, and I've got an older brother that's a year and a half older than me, and I have a younger brother that's a year and a half younger than me. And then I have an older sister, and we're all, we're all born within five years. And so, in a way, I, I grew up, you know, having to fight for food. You, you ever been there? You know, my, my parents would serve us dish, and, and we didn't always have the most money, and so we'd have a certain amount of food. And, and you knew when you sat down at that dinner table that you had to finish your food fast, because if you don't finish your food fast, you're not going to get to the seconds. And so that's all you're going to get right there is what's on your plate right there. And so over time, I developed a lot of food issues. One of my food issues is that I don't like my food touching each other on the plate. You with me there? Like if I've got rice, meat, and salad, I, I, don't, I don't want the rice to mix with the salad, and I don't want the meat to mix with the rice. I, I want everything to just kind of be separate, not nice and compartmentalized on my plate. And what I've, I've recently discovered is that this is actually a genetic thing. Because my son's the same way. You see, if they've got meat that they like, they'll eat that. And if they've got rice that they like, they'll eat that. But if those two things mix, then there's a section on their plate that they won't touch. They, they won't eat it. Because we want to have it compartmentalized. We want it to be separate. And for many people, that's how their lives are. They're compartmentalized. They're separate. Look over in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Some of y'all brothers are like, I don't care about compartmentalization. Mix it all together. It's all good. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. Paul says right here, he says, since then, you've been raised with Christ. So who's he talking to right here? He's talking to people who've become disciples, that have been, who have died with Christ in the waters of baptism, and who've been raised out of the waters of baptism to a new life. He goes, since then, you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. You see, Paul doesn't say, Christ, who is your life on the weekends, or Christ, who is your life at school or work, or who is your partial life. He goes, no, when you become a Christian, it's no longer school friends, work friends, this and that. It's, no, Christ is in everything that we do. 
Whether I'm at work or school or, or at home, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Christ. And I'm in those situations to win people for Christ. But oftentimes that doesn't feel good. Because we, we look at it and we look at our neighbor and we go, man, if that person doesn't like what I'm sharing, then I'm going to have to live next door to my neighbor for the next remainder of my lease. And I'm going to have that awkward experience every time I see them and they know that I invited them to church and they didn't want to come. Or we go, I don't want to share with my classmate because I'm in school with them and I'm going to have that awkward interaction with them every time after I share with them if they don't want to come out. And so we become what I call chameleon Christians. Wow. I just want to blend in. You know, just, you know how chameleons just change and they transform. They, they can hide themselves and camouflage themselves in every situation. And, and that's how some of us can be as Christians. And yet the entire point of Christianity is not that you blend in, but that you stand out. The Chinese have a uh, proverb that says the nail that stands out is the one that gets pounded down. And that's why we don't want to stand out. Because we don't want to take the persecution or the negative looks or even the rejection or discomfort of sharing. You know, sometimes we have qualms about the meanings of the body. And this one's funny to me because we understand commitment to things in every other area of life. And then when it comes to church, we go, I don't know, bro. Isn't that true? We go, yeah, I really want to lose weight. Talk to a personal trainer. Okay, well, let's come to the gym three, four times a week. I've never seen somebody go, yeah, I'm really serious about losing weight. Personal trainer goes, okay, we're going to have to show up to the gym. No, no, no. I just want to come for about five minutes a week. Well, you're not going to lose weight. No, no, I'm going to lose weight. I'm just going to show up for five minutes. No, you, you can't have one thing without the other thing. I remember studying the Bible with one guy. And uh, we're going through the scriptures. And we got to the point where we were talking about what it meant to really be committed to God's kingdom, to God's church. And so we talked about meetings of the body, you know, Sunday service and midweeks and devotionals and Bible talks, etc. And he goes, man, I don't, I don't know about this, man. This is just way too much. I go, what do you mean it's too much? It was just too much to commit to. I go, well, you look like a pretty fit guy. He goes, yeah, I work out. I go, well, that's great. How often do you go to the gym? He goes, well, I go to the gym every day for about two hours. I go, wow, that's pretty committed. He goes, yeah, I take my health and my fitness serious. I go, wow, evidently you take your fitness and your health more serious than you take your spiritual walk with God. Because you will commit every day for two hours a day and you can't commit three times a week for church? What's wrong with us? You know, I think that we've got to transition our thinking to not have to, but want to. Amen. If we're feeling like we have to go to church, there's already a problem in our heart. You already got a qualm inside of there. You got to work out your heart issues and get rid of your qualm because being a part of God's kingdom is incredible. It's awesome. And if you don't know what the kingdom of God is all about, if you can't be committed to it, then you really don't know what God is giving us. You know, sometimes we have qualms about sacrificial giving. I, I appreciate Tim's uh, sharing for contribution. And I will not give something that costs me nothing. You know, it's funny, this past week at midweek, uh, Harvey was sharing about this friend that he's been reaching out to. And he goes, yeah, I really want you to pray for him. My, my friend's name is Mr. Wallet. And one of the brothers goes, yeah, we really need to baptize Mr. Wallet. <laughs> I think we've got to baptize our own wallet. <laughs> you know, I don't know. You know, we don't, we don't get to decide what it takes to evangelize the world. We don't get to decide that. We get to decide whether or not we're going to do what it takes to evangelize the world. Yeah, that's, that's your decision. You know, we, we have our, our special missions contribution coming up here on May 19th. And, um, you know, it's, there's an article written about uh, our mission contribution in the bulletin. And, and it is a challenging thing to raise missions every year. Now you go, how do we get that number 22 times? Well, we basically look at what's needed and then we divide it by the amount of contribution coming in every week. And so when we did that, came out to the number 22. We go, guess what? We're going to take a 22 times missions contribution. Because that's what it takes to evangelize Canada, the world. You with me right here? We don't get to decide that. We only get to decide 
whether we're going to do what it takes. You know, Isaiah was all in. He had no qualms. He had no reservations. And he was willing to do whatever it took. You know, for us, I think we've got to keep our cross and bury our qualms. And our last point, keep caring until your life is gone. You know, at this point, <clears throat> sadly, the Assyrians attack Israel, and in doing so, they annihilate the entire northern ten tribes of Israel. What, what people don't realize is that in, in that situation, when they came in to invade Israel, they not only took out the upper ten tribes of Israel, but they also conquered most of Judah, and they got all the way up to Jerusalem and laid siege to the city of Jerusalem trying to take out Judah as well. At this point, Ahaz's son, King Hezekiah, is now leading Judah. And unlike Ahaz, he decides to rely on God, to pray to God for help against the Natrab in the Assyrian armies. Pick it up in Isaiah 37, verse 21. Isaiah 37, verse 21. <clears throat> Hezekiah receives a, a letter from Sinatrab, the enemy leader. And in this letter, he's making fun of God, mocking God. And so Hezekiah takes this letter and he lays it out in the temple of God and he just starts praying to God, do you see what they're saying about you? Do you see what they're writing about you? And here in verse 21 of chapter 37, it says, Then Isaiah, son of Amos, sent a message to Hezekiah. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Because you have prayed to me concerning Sinatra, king of Assyria, this is the word the Lord has spoken against him. Virgin daughter of Zion despises and mocks you. Daughter of Jerusalem tosses her head as you flee. Who is it that you have ridiculed and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted your eyes in pride? Against the Holy One of Israel. Verse 33. Therefore, this is what the Lord says concerning the king of Assyria. He will not enter the city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with shield or build a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, he will return. He will not enter the city, declares the Lord. I will defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. Then the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies, so Sinatra, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh, and he stayed there. Amen. Wouldn't you if that happened to you? <laughs> you know, here we find that in a response to Hezekiah's prayer, God sends an angel into the camp of the Assyrians, and overnight, by the way, even records that everybody else was sleeping. Overnight, 185,000 guys are killed. Uh, can you just imagine Sinatra waking up the next morning? Gets his coffee and <laughs> walks outside and drops his coffee. All the dead bodies just laid out. 185,000 guys. The Bible says he broke camp, returned to Nineveh, and he stayed there. I'm not messing with this country anymore you see when you choose to fight battles for God God will fight the battle for you in chapter 38 Hezekiah develops a life threatening boil Isaiah gives him a message from God he says get your house in order because you're going to die <laughs> that was not an encouraging message from God and yet, not all of God's messages are meant to be encouraging. And so once again, Hezekiah, learning what happens when you rely on God and you pray, turns to a wall in tears because he knows his life is at its end, and he prays to God, begging God for more time. Amazingly, before Isaiah even leaves the palace, God tells him to go back and tell Hezekiah that he's going to live for 15 more years. 
God extends his life 15 more years. And yet this is when things start to go bad for Hezekiah. He's so fired up about the fact that he's guaranteed 15 more years of life that he becomes arrogant. And he invites the Babylonians to come into his palace and to see all the treasures, all the glory of Israel. And remember, that's what Ahaz did with the Assyrians. He invited them in to help them, and they saw, and then they wanted to take it over. And the same thing happens with the Babylonians. They come in, they see it, and now they want to take it over. And so we find in chapter 39, verse 4, a prophecy given to Hezekiah through Isaiah the prophet. The prophet asked, what did they see in your palace? Well, they saw everything in my palace, Hezekiah said. There's nothing among my treasures that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord Almighty. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord, and some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you will be taken away, and they'll become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. You see right here, Isaiah goes, you shouldn't have done that, Hezekiah. You shouldn't have shown the Babylonians all your stuff. Now they want it all. And so guess what's going to happen now? The Babylonians are going to come in and they're going, to, they're going to, like the Assyrians, take Judah into exile. And everything here that you see, everything that you treasure, everything you valued is going to be carried off into Babylon, including members of your own family. And look in verse 8, what Hezekiah's response is. The word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied, for he thought, well, there will be peace and security in my lifetime. You know, I can't think of a more selfish perspective that one could have. Yeah, so what? All is good. At least I'll have peace and security for myself. As far as my kids go, I mean, they'll figure it out. Everybody else in Israel, they'll figure it out. I've got myself taken care of. And yet, isn't that what stops so many Christians from sharing their faith? I don't want to be uncomfortable. I mean, I, I'm saved. I'm, I'm, I've been made, you know, pure before God, and, and I get to go to heaven, so, hey, it's, it's good for me. Everybody else has got to figure it out for themselves. You know, my, my greatest fear, well, not greatest fear, but at least, you know, everybody's got their fears, maybe my top three fears, is that I'll get up to heaven. I don't know how you guys picture this whole scene and scenario unfolding, I picture, I picture a line going into God's judgment. And in the front of that line, there's a just giant projector screen. And, and when everybody steps forward, they just hand Jesus a little USB flash drive. And I don't know why it's a flash drive. I'm sure they have way more technologically advanced things up there in heaven. But, but they just hand a little USB flash drive. And up on this screen pops all the sin in their life. Now, of course... When a disciple goes, they put it in and poof, it's all fuzzy. It's all blank. You go, oh, praise Jesus, my flash drive has been erased. It's been forgiven. Hallelujah. I can go on in. But you know, I just, I just can imagine as everybody's waiting there in line that we're going to see people that we've known here on earth. Whether it be our neighbor, our classmate, our friend, a family member. And they're going to be in, in line seeing what's coming ahead. And you're going to see the confidence that's on our faces. That we're fired up because we know that we've walked with God. And I believe that some of them that we've not shared with are going to turn to us and they go, Evan, why did you not say anything? Why did you not tell us that this is where my life was headed? Why did you not share the scriptures with us? Why did you not help us get our flash drive erased too? You see, I don't want to have that experience for myself. And I believe right here that Hezekiah had a selfish heart. And our challenge is to keep caring, to care about people. Sometimes it's hard to care because we feel like we care more about the lost than they care about themselves. But you got to keep caring. 
And when you keep caring, you just keep sharing. You know, very excitingly, this past week was the inaugural service for our Auckland International Christian Church in New Zealand. Today is our inaugural service for the Atlanta International Christian Church in Atlanta, Georgia, in the US. And next week is the inaugural service of the Lima, Peru International Christian Church in Lima, Peru. And what's exciting is that with Auckland, that, that was our 98th church of the movement. Our Atlanta church makes number 99, and our Lima, Peru church, when it's inaugurated next week, is going to make number 100 for the movement. And it's exciting, not because we're just reaching some humanistic goal, not because we're just trying to build up worldly man-made organizations. But it's exciting because each of these churches represents a beacon of light for their cities. Where people can come, they can hear the word of God, they can be called higher, they can be taught how to be disciples, and then they can be disciples and make disciples and make disciples. And through the planting of churches, we can see more disciples being made, and eventually we can get to the entire known world in our generation. That's exciting that our movement is doing that. But what about us as individuals? See, sometimes we can think that we're a part of something great, and that means that we're doing great. But is this where your heart has been, where Hezekiah is right here? You know, historically, Hezekiah has a son. His name is Manasseh. And Manasseh's reign was not a righteous reign. In fact, historians call it the reign of terror. He restores idol worship to the people. Bible records that he practiced divination and witchcraft. And he even sacrificed his own children by throwing them into the fires of Molech. In 2 Chronicles 33 verse 9, the Bible says that Manasseh led Judah astray and they did more evil than the nations the Lord had destroyed before them. He goes, you know, all those unrighteous nations that came before Israel, all those worldly nations, yeah, you have done worse than all of them combined. And isn't that how modern day Christianity slash religious, religiosity has become? No different than the world. In fact, you can look at the statistics in the churches and compare them outside and they're more or less the same. You'll find in most Christian churches, the divorce rate inside the church is the same as that outside the church. You'll find in most Christian churches that the amount of immorality that's going on inside the church is equal to the amount of immorality that's going on outside the church. You'll find in most quote-unquote Christian churches that the amount of bad attitudes and contempt inside the church is equal to that outside the church. And so what do we learn from this? If you're not evangelizing the world for Christ, you're going to be evangelized by the world. Legend has it that Manasseh's reign, the reign of terror, was influenced by a demon and a false prophet. Isaiah went from God to preach against Manasseh, which made him an outlaw in Israel. Manasseh has him chased down, and they find Isaiah hiding in a hollowed out tree. And story goes that Manasseh orders the tree sawn in half with Isaiah inside. No doubt this is what was recorded by the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 37, which says, some have even been sawed in two. And yet Isaiah, different than Hezekiah, cared until his last breath. And in his very last breath, he was still preaching the word of God. And I don't know about you, but I think if Isaiah could rewind the hands of time and go all the way back to his calling in Isaiah 6, knowing all that would happen to him, knowing that he would have to walk around naked and shoeless for three years, knowing that he would preach and many wouldn't listen, knowing that he would eventually die at the hands of Manasseh being sawed into, if you'd go back and know all that was going to happen to him, and yet God still asks 
Whom shall I send? And whom will go for us? I believe Isaiah's response would be, here am I. Send me. Thank you, guys. God bless you. Thank <clears throat> you.